Hello, everyone. Before we dive into today's stories, I have a question for you all. Have any of you ever experienced anything strange or eerie while staying at an Airbnb? Share your spooky stories in the comments below. I'd love to hear them. If you're enjoying these chilling stories, don't forget to subscribe. Now let's get settled in and ready for another spine-tingling stories. Burnout. It's a word people toss around, but when you're in the thick of it, it feels like drowning. That's where I was, a travel writer and photographer supposedly living the dream, but really just running on fumes. The breakup didn't help either. It was like someone had pulled the rug out from under my life, leaving me floundering and looking for something solid to hold on to. I needed a break from it all, a place where I could catch my breath and maybe even find a little peace. That's how I ended up in a small coastal town, tucked away from the world, at an Airbnb that promised tranquility and inspiration. The place looked perfect online, quaint, cozy, with just the right amount of old world charm. Margaret, the host, had glowing reviews. People called her sweet, hospitable, the kind of person who made you feel right at home. That's what I needed, a home away from the mess of my life, somewhere to get my head straight, and maybe, just maybe, finish the novel I'd been chipping away at for years. Margaret was waiting for me when I pulled up, all smiles and warm welcomes. She was an older woman, probably in her late sixties, with a kindly face framed by silver hair pulled back into a neat bun. Her eyes, though, were sharp, like she could see right through to the heart of you. The cottage was exactly as advertised, maybe even better. It had this timeless quality, old-fashioned but not outdated with little touches that made it feel lived in and loved. Margaret showed me around, pointing out the kitchen, the cozy living room, the small but comfortable bedroom. Everything was perfect, almost too perfect. Margaret offered to cook for me, saying she enjoyed it and didn't get much chance to cook for others since her husband passed away. I appreciated the gesture. It was nice to be taken care of for a change. As she prepared dinner, she chatted about the town giving me a rundown of local spots she thought I'd enjoy. She seemed to know a lot about what I liked. Too much, in fact. It was a little odd, like she'd read up on me beforehand. I figured she'd just done her homework from my booking profile, but still, it felt a bit invasive. As the days went on, Margaret's attentiveness started to feel stifling. She was always around, always offering something, whether it was a meal, advice, or just idle chatter. It was like she couldn't stand to leave me alone. And then there were the odd little details. Her comments that seemed to suggest she knew more about my personal life than I'd ever mentioned. I dismissed it as coincidence, or maybe just her being perceptive. After all, she was just trying to be a good host, right? But the more I settled in, the more I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. It was in the way Margaret watched me. Not overtly, but subtly, like she was studying me. There was a hint of something behind her kind eyes, something I couldn't quite put my finger on. I told myself I was being paranoid, that I needed to relax and focus on my writing. But the feeling lingered, a shadow at the edge of my thoughts, whispering that there was more to Margaret and this perfect little town that met the eye. The first few days at Margaret's cottage, I found myself diving into my writing with a clarity I hadn't felt in months. The ocean's rhythm, the quiet of the town, it all seemed perfect. But then, small things started to niggle at me. It began with items in the cottage. I'm meticulous with my belongings, especially when writing, my notebook always on the left side of the desk, my pen placed precisely beside it. Yet, I would come back from a walk and find the pen moved or the notebook open to a different page. At first, I dismissed it as forgetfulness, perhaps a side effect of my lingering stress but the incidents became too frequent to ignore. It wasn't just my writing materials. Sometimes my clothes seemed slightly shifted in the drawer, or my shoes not quite where I'd left them. It felt silly to be paranoid over such minor things, but the sensation of being observed persisted, gnawing at me. One afternoon, needing a break from the cottage's increasingly stifling atmosphere, I decided to explore the town further. It was quaint, with a main street that looked like it hadn't changed in decades. I stopped at a small cafe, ordering a coffee and striking up a conversation with the barista. When I mentioned I was staying at Margaret's Airbnb, 
Her friendly expression tightened ever so slightly. Margaret's been here forever, she said, her tone carefully neutral. Always taking in guests. She's very involved with the community. There was a pause, and then she added, almost as an afterthought. Some people find her a bit much, though. You know, always around, always knowing things. I prodded gently, curious but wary, and she hesitated before saying, a few guests mentioned feeling like she was too attentive, but nothing serious. It was enough to unsettle me further. I left the cafe with a growing sense of unease, wondering if there was more to Margaret than her grandmotherly facade. Returning to the cottage, I found Margaret in the garden, pruning roses. She greeted me with the same warm smile, asking about my day. The conversation felt normal, but there was a weight to it, an unspoken tension. Margaret offered to cook dinner again, and when I suggested I might go out or even try my hand in the kitchen, her smile faltered. Oh dear, you've had such a long day. Let me take care of you, she insisted, her voice smooth but with an undercurrent of insistence. It wasn't just a suggestion, it was a subtle command. I felt a chill run down my spine. Over the next couple of days, Margaret's presence became almost oppressive. She was always around, always watching. It wasn't just when she was physically there. It was a constant feeling, like the cottage itself was aware of my every move. Her subtle comments about my schedule and habits, things I hadn't told her, became more frequent. She even mentioned a book I liked, one I was sure I hadn't discussed with anyone recently. The sense of confinement grew, the cozy cottage now feeling more like a gilded cage. The breaking point came late one night. Unable to sleep, I decided to read in bed. As I adjusted the bedside lamp, the light caught something unusual about the antique clock on the nightstand. It had always seemed an odd piece, ornate and slightly out of place in the otherwise modern decor. I picked it up, inspecting it closely. That's when I saw it. A small, barely noticeable lens, hidden within the intricate carvings. A camera. My stomach dropped. It couldn't be, I thought. But the evidence was right there. Panic setting in, I systematically went through the cottage, searching for other cameras. I found them in the living room, the kitchen, even the bathroom. Each discovery felt like a punch to the gut. My sanctuary had been a stage, every private moment recorded and observed. I confronted Margaret the next morning, barely able to contain my anger and disgust. She met my accusations with a calm that bordered on eerie. First, she denied it, claiming ignorance. But when I showed her the cameras, her demeanor changed. She became apologetic, her voice soft and soothing, as if I were a frightened child. It's for your safety, she said, her eyes never leaving mine. There have been incidents in the past, break-ins. I just wanted to make sure you were safe. Her words did little to quell my fury. I pushed her, demanding to know why she hadn't told me, why she thought it was acceptable to invade my privacy. That's when her tone shifted, the sweetness evaporating like mist. You're too fragile, Lisa, she said, her voice cold and matter of fact. I've seen it before in other guests. You need someone to look out for you, to guide you. The words were a slap in the face, and the underlying message was clear. Margaret didn't see herself as a host, but as a caretaker, perhaps even a guardian to her guests. My fear crystallized into a cold, hard knot in my stomach. I realized that leaving wouldn't be as simple as packing my bags and walking out the door. Margaret had orchestrated everything, right down to my meals, my movements, and now my state of mind. She saw me as another project, another vulnerable person to mold and control. As I stood there trying to process this nightmare, Margaret's expression softened, her voice once again adopting that sickly sweet tone. Don't worry, dear, she said, placing a hand on my arm. I'm here to help you. The threat was clear, wrapped in the guise of concern. I knew then that I had to leave. But how do you escape someone who's always watching, always one step ahead? I felt trapped, not just by the cameras or Margaret's invasive attention, 
but by the realization that I was isolated in this small town, far from anyone I knew or trusted. As the reality of my situation sank in, the cottage felt like a prison, a prison with Margaret holding the keys. The morning after discovering the cameras, I couldn't sit still. I had to know how deep Margaret's deception went. My skin crawled with the thought of her watching me, scrutinizing every movement, every private moment. I was determined to find out everything she had been hiding. I knew I had to act quickly and carefully, or risk Margaret catching on to my plan. I waited until Margaret was busy in the garden, her back turned to the house. This was my chance. I'd noticed a set of keys on the counter the night before, likely forgotten or assumed safe under her watchful eye. I snatched them up and quietly made my way to the basement, which I'd only glanced into before. At the bottom of the stairs, there was a door I hadn't paid much attention to, mostly because it had always been locked. Now, I knew it was hiding something important. The key turned in the lock with a soft click, and I pushed the door open, holding my breath. What I saw inside was chilling. The room was dimly lit, and lined with file cabinets and shelves filled with old VHS tapes and newer digital media. There were also binders stacked high, labeled with names. My heart pounded as I pulled out a few files, flipping through pages of notes, medical histories, and even personal letters. Some of the most shocking content was deeply private. Confessions about failed relationships, fears, and insecurities. It was as if Margaret had extracted these secrets from her guests, cataloging them like a collector with rare artifacts. As I continued to explore, I found photos, some candid and some clearly taken without the subject's knowledge. A chill ran down my spine when I realized there were tapes of guests in their rooms, unaware they were being recorded. It was an overwhelming invasion of privacy, and the full extent of Margaret's control became painfully clear. She had been manipulating her guests, exploiting their vulnerabilities to keep them under her influence. Some files hinted at guests being coerced into staying longer than intended, subtly pressured by Margaret's insidious kindness. Just as the gravity of the situation settled in, the door creaked open. I turned, heart in my throat, to see Margaret standing there, her face a mask of cold fury. The kindly old woman facade dropped away, replaced by something much more dangerous. Her eyes were hard, calculating. You shouldn't have gone poking around, Lisa, she said, her voice low and devoid of the warmth she'd feigned before. I tried to stammer an apology, but she cut me off. You see, people think they know what's best for themselves, but they don't. They make poor choices, get hurt. I help them. I protect them from their own foolishness. Her voice hardened, and she stepped closer, blocking the doorway. You needed guidance, too. I could see it from the moment you arrived carrying all that pain and confusion. You're not well, Lisa. You need me. The air felt thick, and I struggled to breathe. Margaret's words were both an accusation and a threat. She believed she was some kind of savior, protecting her guests from themselves. The twisted conviction in her voice left no doubt. She wouldn't let me leave. Not now. But I knew I couldn't stay. Not with her watching my every move dissecting my life like a science experiment. Panic rose in me, but I forced it down. I couldn't afford to show fear or defiance. I needed to play along, to make Margaret believe she had convinced me. You're right, I said, my voice trembling just enough to be believable. I've been so lost. I didn't realize how much I needed help. Margaret's expression softened slightly, and she nodded, pleased with what she thought was a breakthrough. Over the next few hours, I pretended to accept her twisted worldview, nodding at her remarks, and even thanking her for her care. Inside, my mind raced, formulating an escape plan. I had to wait for the right moment, when Margaret was least likely to suspect anything. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, she went out to run an errand, leaving me alone in the house. My heart pounded in my chest as I quickly gathered my essentials. My car keys were nowhere to be found, and my phone was missing too. Panic flared, but I forced myself to stay calm. Margaret must have taken them to prevent me from leaving. I searched her office and, fortunately, found a spare set of car keys and an old phone she'd overlooked. 
It wasn't much, but it would have to do. With trembling hands, I left the house, glancing nervously over my shoulder. Every second felt like an eternity as I reached my car, praying it would start. The engine roared to life, and I sped down the driveway, not daring to look back. I drove straight to the nearest house, pounding on the door until a bewildered neighbor answered. I hurriedly explained the situation, and they called the police. As I waited for the authorities to arrive, the weight of what I'd discovered settled on me like a shroud. Margaret wasn't just a meddling host. She was a predator, preying on vulnerable people who came to her for rest and recovery. The thought of how close I'd come to being completely ensnared in her web made my skin crawl. Even now, in the relative safety of a neighbor's home, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. A lingering paranoia that Margaret might be lurking nearby, waiting to reclaim her latest project. The police arrived, and I told them everything. As they escorted me back to the cottage, the sun setting in a sky painted with ominous reds and purples, I felt a mix of relief and dread. Margaret had believed she was helping, but her help came at the cost of freedom, autonomy, and privacy. I knew one thing for certain. Whatever happened next, I couldn't allow her twisted form of care to trap anyone else. The police arrived swiftly, their lights flashing in the growing dusk. Detective Harper, a seasoned investigator with a no-nonsense demeanor, took my statement, her eyes widening as I recounted the events. The horror of it all seemed to settle in the room like a thick fog, making it hard to breathe. As the officers searched Margaret's cottage, they uncovered more than I had imagined. Journals meticulously detailing Margaret's interactions with guests, her manipulative techniques, and even her twisted justifications. Each entry painted a chilling picture of a woman obsessed with control, seeing herself as a benevolent guide for the lost souls who stayed under her roof. Margaret was arrested on the spot. The shockwave through the community was palpable. Many had seen her as a kind, if slightly overbearing, figure, a fixture of their quiet town. The truth of her actions left everyone stunned and unsettled. The investigation revealed that while some guests had felt uncomfortable, none had reported it, thinking it harmless or a figment of their imagination. It took my discovery for the full extent of her invasive practices to come to light. Trust became an elusive concept, something I had to rebuild piece by piece. Detective Harper checked in regularly, offering not just updates on the case, but genuine support helping me navigate the psychological scars left behind. Her assurance that Margaret would face justice brought some comfort, but the trauma lingered. Writing became my therapy. I penned an article about my experience, detailing the insidious nature of Margaret's control and the importance of safeguarding one's privacy. Published under a pseudonym, the piece was both a cathartic release and a warning to others. Be cautious even in places that seem idyllic and hosts that seem benign. Arriving at the Airbnb, I felt a mix of anticipation and relief. The photos had promised a cozy cottage nestled in a quiet part of town, just the kind of place I needed for a week of uninterrupted writing. As I pulled up, the quaint charm I had imagined started to unravel. The paint on the front door was chipped, the porch steps creaked ominously, and there was a noticeable sag in the roof. I shrugged it off determined not to let a few imperfections ruin the trip. After all, the online listing had garnered rave reviews. Still, my gut clenched as I turned the key in the rusty lock, the door swinging open with a groan that set my nerves on edge. Inside, the cottage was worse. The air felt damp and musty, carrying the scent of neglect. Wires dangled from the ceiling where a light fixture should have been, and the furniture looked like it had been salvaged from a yard sale. I noticed the locks on the windows were broken, leaving me uneasy about security. My writer's mind immediately began spinning potential stories. An expose on the risks of vacation rentals, perhaps. It wasn't the peaceful retreat I had envisioned, but the prospect of turning this experience into a compelling article kept me from packing up right away. After settling in, I decided to explore the town. The main street was a charming blend of antique shops and cafes, the kind of place that seemed to have stepped out of time. I spent the day wandering, taking notes, and chatting with locals, trying to ignore the nagging discomfort about the cottage. By evening, 
I'd collected enough material to fill several pages and was feeling more at ease. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I headed back, my thoughts drifting to the articles I could write about small town life. My good mood evaporated the moment I stepped inside. The place had been ransacked, drawers were pulled out, their contents strewn across the floor. My laptop and camera, which I had foolishly left out, were gone. My heart pounded in my chest as I checked the windows, still broken, of course. The realization hit me hard. Someone had been watching, waiting for me to leave. Panic set in. This was no longer just an inconvenience. It was a violation. I felt exposed and vulnerable. A stranger in a town I barely knew. I grabbed my phone and dialed the local police, my fingers trembling. The dispatcher was calm, asking for details while I tried to keep my voice steady. I also called Airbnb, explaining the situation and requesting immediate assistance. They promised to look into it, but I couldn't shake the feeling of dread. What if whoever had broken in came back? I packed a bag hastily, leaving most of my belongings behind, and checked into the nearest hotel, locking the door behind me with a shiver of relief. The next morning, as I packed my things to leave, an older woman approached me. She introduced herself as Mrs. Jenkins, a neighbor who had lived in the area for decades. Concern etched on her face. She asked if I was the one staying in the cottage. When I nodded, she sighed, confirming my worst fears. The owner, Mark, had a reputation. She lowered her voice, glancing around as if someone might overhear. He's not who you think he is, she warned. Mrs. Jenkins revealed that Mark had a criminal history, including theft and fraud. She and other neighbors had seen strange comings and goings at the cottage, but despite complaints, nothing had changed. Her words sent a chill down my spine. This wasn't just about a shoddy rental, it was something more sinister. My journalistic instincts kicked in, and I knew I had to dig deeper. Mrs. Jenkins's concern, combined with my own experience, suggested a pattern of behavior that needed investigating. As I left the cottage behind, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was stepping into a much darker story than I had anticipated. The real work was just beginning. After my unsettling conversation with Mrs. Jenkins, I couldn't let the matter rest. There was a story here, a serious one, and it needed to be told. I reached out to a journalist friend of mine, Sam, who had a knack for uncovering the truth. Sam and I spent hours sifting through public records and online forums, piecing together Mark's shady past. It turned out that this wasn't the first time he had run into trouble with the law. He had a history of theft and fraud, with several charges that had mysteriously disappeared from court records, likely due to technicalities or insufficient evidence. As we dug deeper, a disturbing pattern emerged. Mark had been using Airbnb and other rental platforms to lure unsuspecting guests with misleading listings. The properties were often advertised as charming and well-kept, but upon arrival, guests found dilapidated conditions. The real kicker was that these guests often reported thefts, but the incidents were brushed off as isolated cases of petty crime. Sam and I were convinced this was more than just bad luck or coincidence. Mark seemed to be systematically targeting his renters, taking advantage of the anonymity and transient nature of vacation rentals. To corroborate our findings, Sam and I contacted several past guests who had left negative reviews or had hinted at suspicious activities in their feedback. It wasn't easy. Many were hesitant to talk, still shaken by their experiences. But a few were willing to share their stories, providing a clearer picture of what was happening. There were accounts of missing valuables, strange noises at night, and even reports of seeing Mark or his associates lurking around the properties. It was enough to suggest that Mark had been operating a small-scale theft ring using his rentals as a cover. Armed with this evidence, we decided it was time to take our findings to the police. We presented our research, including testimonies from the victims and the data we had gathered on Mark's activities. The police, initially skeptical, took a closer look at our evidence and agreed there was enough to warrant further investigation. They decided to set up a surveillance operation around the cottage, hoping to catch Mark in the act. The tension was palpable as the police staked out the property. Sam and I stayed close, anxiously awaiting any news. We didn't have to wait long. A few nights into the operation, Mark made his move. Under the cover of darkness, 
he approached the cottage, unaware that he was being watched. The police observed as he checked the surroundings, ensuring the guests were out before entering through a side window. It was a textbook break-in, with Mark carefully avoiding the main entrance to minimize noise. As the officers moved in to arrest him, they discovered something even more damning. Hidden cameras strategically placed around the property. These cameras were rigged to send live feeds to Mark, allowing him to monitor the guests' movements and ensure they were out before he struck. It was a level of premeditation that shocked even the seasoned officers. Mark had been meticulously planning these break-ins, exploiting the guests' trust and the platform's vulnerabilities. Mark was arrested on the spot, along with two associates who were caught nearby, acting as lookouts. The evidence against them was overwhelming. The police found stolen items from multiple victims in Mark's possession, along with footage from the hidden cameras. It was clear that Mark had been running this operation for months, if not longer, under the guise of being a legitimate Airbnb host. As the police took Mark and his accomplices into custody, I felt a mix of emotions. Relief, certainly, but also a lingering sense of violation and disbelief. This man had been preying on people who trusted him with their safety and security. It was a harsh reminder of the darker side of the sharing economy, where trust can be easily exploited. In the end, Mark faced multiple charges, including theft, fraud, and illegal surveillance. The case received widespread media attention, highlighting the need for stricter regulations and security measures in the vacation rental industry. For me, it was a sobering experience that underscored the importance of due diligence and vigilance, not just as a traveler, but as a journalist committed to uncovering the truth. The story of Mark's criminal activities, once it broke, spread like wildfire. Media outlets quickly picked up on the sensational details. A seemingly harmless Airbnb host running a sophisticated theft operation under the radar. My articles, supported by first-hand accounts from victims and a trove of evidence uncovered during the investigation, provided a comprehensive narrative of Mark's scams. The public was shocked, and the story sparked a broader conversation about the safety and regulation of short-term rental platforms. News programs and online publications emphasized the glaring gaps in security and accountability on platforms like Airbnb. There were calls for stricter background checks on hosts, improved property vetting, and clearer guidelines for guests to ensure their safety. The incident highlighted how easily trust could be manipulated in the sharing economy, pushing companies and regulators to consider more stringent measures to protect users. Mark's arrest marked the beginning of a long legal process. The charges against him were severe. Multiple counts of theft, fraud, and illegal surveillance. As the evidence mounted, it became clear that Mark had exploited a system meant to foster community and trust. The court proceedings were closely followed by the media, with each new revelation painting a more damning picture of his activities. In the end, Mark was sentenced to a significant prison term, a fitting consequence for the harm he caused to so many unsuspecting guests. For Mrs. Jenkins and the rest of the community, Mark's incarceration brought a palpable sense of relief. The neighborhood had been living under a cloud of suspicion and unease, unsure of the true extent of Mark's wrongdoings. With him behind bars, they felt a renewed sense of security. Mrs. Jenkins, in particular, was praised for her vigilance and willingness to speak up, helping to uncover the truth. My own role in the story didn't go unnoticed. The articles I published, detailing the investigation and its findings, were widely read and praised for their thoroughness and clarity. I received messages of support and thanks from readers, some of whom shared their own experiences with fraudulent hosts. It was gratifying to see the impact of my work, not just in bringing a criminal to justice, but in raising awareness about the potential dangers lurking in the world of vacation rentals. The experience left me changed. I'd always prided myself on my attention to detail and commitment to uncovering the truth. But this investigation had been a stark reminder of the stakes involved. It wasn't just about telling an interesting story. It was about safeguarding the trust of readers and the public. I became more cautious, not just in my travels, but in my work as a journalist. The world is full of unexpected dangers, and it's our responsibility to shine a light on them. Looking back, I'm proud of what we achieved. The case led to meaningful discussions about improving safety standards on platforms like Airbnb. It spurred both companies and regulators to take action, implementing stricter background checks and better support systems for users. 
While there's still much work to be done, I'm hopeful that our efforts made a difference. As I plan my next journey, I do so with a heightened awareness of the complexities and challenges of travel writing. It's a reminder that in every story, there's a deeper truth waiting to be uncovered. A truth that can sometimes make the world a safer, more transparent place. And that's a mission I'm more committed to than ever before. I've always been drawn to the fringes of the map, the places where the lines blur and the world feels just a little bit untamed. Maybe it's the photographer in me, always searching for that perfect shot, the one that tells a story all on its own. Or maybe it's just a restless spirit, itching to escape the monotony of city life. Whatever the reason, it led me here, to the California desert, to a tiny house advertised as an off-the-grid retreat for the adventurous soul. I found the listing on Airbnb after a night of scrolling through endless urban lofts and suburban cottages. There were no reviews, just a handful of pictures that showed a quaint little house, stark against the vastness of the desert landscape. The place had a kind of rugged charm, solar panels, wind turbines, and a promise of pure, unadulterated solitude. It was exactly what I needed, a break from the noise, both literal and metaphorical. There was something else, too. A curiosity, maybe even a bit of a thrill at the prospect of the unknown. No reviews meant no one had yet mapped this place in the digital world. It was a blank canvas, a story waiting to be told. And so, with a click and a few keystrokes, I booked it. The drive out was long and winding, each mile taking me further from civilization and deeper into the arid landscape. The desert stretched out endlessly, a canvas of muted earth tones punctuated by jagged rock formations and the occasional saguaro cactus standing sentinel. The sky was a deep, unbroken blue, and the air, though hot, felt strangely clean and pure, like I was breathing in a piece of the earth itself. As I pulled up to the property, the tiny house came into view. It was exactly as the pictures had shown, a small, boxy structure with a roof deck and solar panels glinting in the sun. But in person, it felt different, smaller, almost fragile against the vastness of the desert. I stepped out of the car, the crunch of gravel underfoot the only sound in the stillness. The house itself was a mix of old and new. The exterior, painted a faded teal, looked like it had seen better days, but the solar panels and wind turbine hinted at a more recent update. Inside, it was a different story. The decor was eclectic, to say the least. A mishmash of old artifacts and strange decorations cluttered the small space. Vintage cameras lined one shelf, while another was filled with peculiar knickknacks, oddly shaped stones, feathers, and what looked like a collection of animal bones. It was like stepping into a museum of curiosities, each item begging for a backstory. Then there was Elias, the owner. He appeared almost out of nowhere, stepping lightly from behind the house as if he'd been waiting for me. He was an older man, maybe in his late sixties, with a kind face and a shock of white hair that seemed to glow in the afternoon sun. He greeted me warmly, shaking my hand with a firm grip and a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. There was something off-putting about him, a subtle intensity in the way he held my gaze a fraction too long. Elias led me on a brief tour of the property, pointing out the features of the house and casually mentioning some local folklore. He spoke of the desert with a reverence that bordered on obsession, recounting tales of ancient tribes and mysterious symbols that supposedly dotted the landscape. His voice was calm, almost hypnotic, but there was an undercurrent of something darker, a hint of something he wasn't saying. It piqued my interest, but also set a small knot of unease in my stomach. As he finished the tour, Elias paused, looking out over the desert. It's a place of secrets, he said softly almost to himself. The desert remembers everything. He turned to me then, that strange intensity back in his eyes. Just be careful where you tread. Not everything out here is as it seems. With that cryptic remark, he left me alone, retreating to his own small dwelling a few hundred yards away. I watched him go, a shiver running down my spine despite the heat. There was something about Elias in this place that I couldn't quite put my finger on. A story just waiting to be uncovered, hidden beneath the surface of this desolate, beautiful land. That first night in the desert was oddly serene. As the sun dipped below the horizon, 
the sky erupted into a dazzling display of stars, the kind you only see far away from city lights. I sat on the roof deck of the tiny house, the air cool and dry, listening to the distant sounds of the desert. It was mostly quiet, just the occasional rustle of the wind or the distant call of some nocturnal creature. It was peaceful, almost hypnotic, and I found myself drifting into a comfortable dreamlike state. But as the night deepened, a different kind of sound caught my attention. A faint howling, far off, but distinct. It wasn't the lonely cry of a coyote. It was deeper, more resonant, echoing off the rocks like a ghostly choir. I tried to tell myself it was just the wind playing tricks, but something about it felt off, unsettling. It lingered in the back of my mind as I drifted off to sleep. The next morning, I set out to explore the area. The early light painted the desert in shades of gold and amber, making everything look almost magical. But as I wandered, I stumbled upon something that jolted me out of my reverie, strange symbols carved into the rocks. They were unlike anything I'd seen before, intricate and cryptic, like a language from another world. There were spirals, crosses, and shapes that defied easy description. I took photos, intrigued, but also unnerved. When I mentioned them to Elias later, he barely glanced at the images. Old indigenous markings, he said dismissively. The people who lived here centuries ago left them behind. He offered no further explanation, and something in his tone discouraged further questions. It felt like he was holding something back, a detail too important or too dangerous to share. Determined to capture the desert's unique beauty, I spent the next few days exploring further afield. The landscape was stark and unforgiving, but there was a raw beauty to it, an untouched quality that was rare. As I ventured deeper, I found more of those strange symbols, often accompanied by oddities like piles of stones arranged in patterns, or animal skulls bleached white by the sun. One day, I came across a clearing that looked like it had been recently used. There was a fire pit, surrounded by stones, and what appeared to be the remnants of food and drink. Fresh footprints, some human, some unidentifiable, traced the area. It was a chilling discovery, especially considering how isolated the place was. The sense of being watched, which had been a faint prickling at the back of my neck, grew stronger. As I crouched to take a closer look, I glanced up and saw Elias in the distance, watching me from atop a rocky outcrop. He didn't move, just stood there, a dark silhouette against the bright sky. It was unsettling, the way he seemed to blend into the landscape, appearing and disappearing like a mirage. I waved, but he didn't respond, just turned and walked away, leaving me with a sense of unease that I couldn't shake. The climax of my exploration came when I stumbled upon an abandoned settlement, hidden in a secluded valley. The buildings were in ruins, reduced to crumbling walls and piles of stone. It was clear that people had once lived here, but there was something eerie about the place, as if it had been left in a hurry. In the center of what must have been the main square stood a makeshift altar, adorned with fresh offerings, flowers, small bones, and even a few coins. It looked like some kind of ritualistic site, still in use despite the apparent abandonment. I snapped a few photos, each click of the shutter echoing in the oppressive silence. As I did, a feeling of dread settled over me, heavy and cold. It was as if the air itself was charged with something malevolent, a silent warning to leave. The thought of Elias watching from somewhere unseen, maybe even part of whatever had happened here, sent a shiver down my spine. Hurriedly, I made my way back to the tiny house, my mind racing with questions and dark suspicions. What was this place really? Who was Elias? And what was his connection to the symbols, the settlement, and the strange gatherings in the desert? The initial charm of my desert retreat had been replaced by a growing sense of danger. As the sun began to set, casting long shadows over the landscape, I knew one thing for certain. I was no longer alone out here, and whatever was lurking in the desert was far more than just old folklore. After the unsettling discoveries in the desert, I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something far more complex and sinister happening around me. Back at the tiny house, 
I dug into the research with a fervor fueled by equal parts curiosity and fear. The strange symbols I had photographed were the key. I was sure of it. As I pored over the photos and compared them with online resources, a pattern began to emerge. The symbols were not just random carvings. They were deeply tied to ancient indigenous beliefs. They spoke of a time when the land was considered sacred, inhabited by spirits and entities that demanded respect and occasionally offerings. Some of the symbols indicated protective spells, while others were warnings, markers of places to avoid or rituals to follow. The more I read, the more I realized that these weren't just historical relics. There were accounts, buried in obscure forums and old books, suggesting that such practices had never truly ended, just gone underground. As night fell, a prickling sense of unease settled over me. The desert, so peaceful during the day, seemed to hold its breath in the darkness. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, not just by Elias, but by something far older and more enigmatic. My laptop screen dimmed, the only light in the room, as I continued to scroll through the research, piecing together the puzzle. The conclusion was chilling. The society that had once worshipped in these lands might still be active, conducting rituals and maintaining their ancient traditions in secret. That night, unable to sleep, I found myself drawn to the window. The moon hung low, casting an eerie glow over the landscape. In the distance, near the abandoned settlement, I saw a flicker of light. My curiosity overpowered my fear, and I grabbed my camera, carefully stepping outside. Keeping to the shadows, I made my way closer, the sound of distant chanting growing clearer with each step. What I saw next was like something out of a fever dream. Elias, along with several others, was gathered around a fire. They were dressed in long, flowing robes, their faces obscured by masks. The chanting was rhythmic, almost hypnotic, and they moved in a slow, deliberate circle around the flames. It was a ritual, unmistakably, with the symbols I had seen earlier drawn around the clearing in chalk or some kind of powder. My heart raced as I snapped photos, the reality of the situation crashing over me. This was not just an odd historical curiosity. It was a living, breathing practice, and I had stumbled right into the middle of it. Retreating to the tiny house, my mind raced with what to do next. Leaving seemed the only logical option. I quickly packed my things, adrenaline coursing through my veins. But as I turned to leave, I froze. Elias stood outside the window, his face half-lit by the pale moonlight. There was no warmth in his expression now, only a cold, unsettling calm. You shouldn't be wandering the desert at night, he said, his voice low and measured. There are dangers out here you can't understand. I swallowed hard, trying to keep my voice steady. I think it's time for me to go. Elias didn't move. His gaze was fixed on me, unblinking. You've seen too much, he said quietly. The desert has a way of revealing its secrets, but not everyone is meant to know them. Our ways are ancient, older than any city or town. We protect what is sacred. There was a threat implicit in his words, and I could feel the weight of it pressing down on me. The realization hit me like a punch to the gut. They knew I had been watching. They knew I had been documenting everything. For a moment, panic threatened to overtake me. Was I just another offering, another part of their rituals? You don't belong here, Elias continued, his tone softening slightly. But now that you know, you have a choice. Leave and forget what you've seen, or... He let the sentence hang, the unspoken consequence chilling in its ambiguity. Feeling trapped and desperate, I nodded, muttering something about leaving first thing in the morning. Elias stared at me for a long moment, as if weighing my words, then finally stepped back, disappearing into the shadows. As soon as he was gone, I bolted for my things, determined to get out before they could stop me. Every sound, every creak of the house seemed amplified, like the desert itself was holding its breath, waiting to see what I would do. With my bag hastily packed, I slipped out the back door, avoiding the main road in case Elias or the others were watching. My car was parked a little distance away, hidden from the house by a cluster of rocks. I made it there, heart pounding glancing back one last time to see if I was being followed. 
The desert was silent, but I felt eyes on me all the same. I climbed into the car and started the engine, the sound loud in the quiet night. As I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was leaving more than just a place behind. There was a darkness in that desert, a secret that people like Elias were willing to protect at all costs. And as I sped down the dirt road, the moonlit landscape rushing past, I knew I would never forget the cold, knowing look in Elias's eyes, or the ominous chant that echoed through the night air. Back in the safety of my apartment, miles away from the oppressive silence of the desert, I tried to put the experience behind me. But the images of Elias and the ritual, the cryptic symbols, and the eerie chants haunted my thoughts. The feeling of being watched lingered, an invisible weight pressing down on my shoulders. Determined to process the ordeal, I decided to write about it, framing the piece as a cautionary tale about the perils of isolated places and the danger of uncovering things best left undisturbed. The article was more than just a recounting. It was a warning. I wrote about the allure of the unknown and the thin line between curiosity and recklessness. I wanted others to understand that some mysteries are wrapped in layers of danger, protected by those who would go to any lengths to keep them concealed. Just as I was about to send the draft to my editor, I noticed something chilling. On my desk, beneath a stack of papers, was a small stone carved with one of the symbols I had seen in the desert. It hadn't been there before. My hands trembled as I picked it up, the weight of the message clear. I was still being watched. The fear that had shadowed my steps in the desert returned full force. The secret society's reach was far greater than I had imagined and they knew where I was. With a heavy heart, I published the piece under a pseudonym, hoping to protect myself while still sharing my story. The final lines were a stark reminder of the risks of venturing too far into the unknown. Some secrets are better left buried, for they hold the power to haunt those who seek them. The experience left me changed, my once insatiable curiosity tempered by a newfound caution. I resolved to steer clear of remote places and to warn others of the dangers that lurk in the shadows of the unknown. Yet, even as I tried to move on, the memory of the desert and its dark mysteries lingered, a silent testament to the secrets hidden in the vast, untamed world beyond the city's edge.